one of the properties of coordination compounds is that they often have color to them. This color is coming from the splitting of the D sublevel. So the D sublevel for these metals generally have electrons in them. And the ligands will push on certain orbitals more than they'll push on other orbitals. So when they push on orbitals, so they're present right above the orbital. So they push on that orbital and they push the energy of that orbital up to a higher level. So we have different splitting patterns for the different geometries that we have. The one that we'll be playing with primarily is the octahedral splitting pattern. So I want you to be able to know that it's three lower levels and two higher levels. Tetrahedral does the reverse as two lower and three higher square planars, two, one, 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 and for linears, two, two, and one. But we will play with the octahedral primarily. If I need to use one of the other three, I will provide that splitting pattern for us. How much the ligand split it is called the splitting energy. We use the uh, capital Greek letter delta to represent our splitting energy. And different ligands have different effects on the splitting of these. So on the right side here, these are considered to be strong fields. So they create a large splitting, large delta. And we'll look at the electrons in the orbitals later on. We'll talk about it in terms of spin, high spin, low spin. So ammonia, ethylene diamine, cyanide, carbon monoxide are considered to be our strong field liquids. Below that, water, chloride, hydroxide, chloride, uh, bromide and iodide are considered to be weak field splittings. They create a small delta here. And later on, we'll see them as being high spin. So we're going to be, we see color in most, most of these compounds. So we're going to talk about the energy of the absorbed light. So we know the energy of light, so in this case, delta is H nu or HC over lambda. But in terms of what we see versus what we absorb, it's a little opposite here, or complementary. So the inner circle, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, if we absorb one of these colors, what we're going to see is the opposite color. So if we absorb violet, we're going to see yellow. So the outside ring is showing what we see, the color of the compound. So it's the complementary of the color that has actually been absorbed. And we know that um, in terms of red, orange, yellow, blue, violet, the red is our lowest energy light. Our violet is our highest energy light. So the vertical here is dividing uh, the low and the high energies. So the right side is our lowest energy or lowest delta. The left side is our highest energy, highest delta. So we can talk about the, the delta, the uh, splitting energy, just based on the color complex. So we're comparing a blue complex versus a red complex. So a, a blue complex will absorb orange. A red complex will absorb green. That's pretty wrong thing. So blue will absorb orange. A red will absorb green. So the green is higher energy than the orange. So what we see, the red will have a higher delta for us. But to have color, we need to have some electrons on the D level, but not have the D level completely filled. So we're looking at the excitation of energy from the lower level to the higher level. So that will absorb energy. And it happens to be in our a visible wavelength, but we need to have some electrons on the lower level, and we need to have an empty spot on the upper level. So we can't have 10 electrons, we can't have no electrons. So colorless compounds would be like aluminum tetrahydroxo, and it has 
no electrons. So aluminum has three P electrons, but no three D electrons. For zinc, uh, with six waters, has a two plus charge. That's the charge on the zinc. Uh, zinc is in column 12. It will lose two electrons for that two plus. For those two electrons, it will come from the S sublevel, and it's going to leave the D sublevel completely filled. So the zinc will have 10 D electrons. Some colored compounds, uh, copper with water. This is one of the more common things that you might be able to see around society somehow. Uh, we use copper to uh, uh, create patinas on metal surfaces, a copper patina on metal surfaces, but that um, copper in solution has that complex of six water molecules around it in a blue solution. We do a copper uh, sulfate, it tends to be blue because it's a hexahydrate. If you evaporate the water off, heat the water off, the copper sulfate turns clear. But with that six water there, we have a blue color. It has nine D electrons. Uh, iron cyanide uh, with six cyanides is a component of Prussian blue and it has six D electrons. So we need to have some D electrons, not zero, but we can't have 10 D electrons. Now, if we look at the energy of light, we uh, have a complex, a compound that will absorb light at 540 nanometers. So what's the energy of the crystal fields living? So we want to convert our nanometers into meters. So we multiply by one over 10 to the nine nanometers. And when that 540 nanometers becomes 5.4 times 10 to the minus seven meters. Now we know energy, in this case delta is H nu or HC over lambda. So we put in our values to HC and lambda, rent their calculator, we end up with 3.68 times 10 to the minus 19. Now if we don't ask you for units, this is a good and valid answer. Sometimes we'll ask you for kilojoules per mole. We like you know, small numbers instead of those large exponents at times. So if we want kilojoules per mole, we can convert our joules into kilojoules. Then we're going to multiply by our value number to get our per mole. When we do that, we end up with a 222 kilojoules per mole instead of the tiny 3.68 times 10 minus 19 joules per photon. But here's the two answers depending on what units we may ask for. So let's look at the spin of these a little bit more. And um, this also, spin is also a property of magnetism for us. So the two properties, two magnetic properties that we can find in these compounds are paramagnetic or diamagnetic. So paramagnetic will have unpaired electrons. The unpaired electrons create a magnetic spin. And that spin, that magnetic field, is attracted by magnetic fields. So it gets pulled into magnetic fields. If we only have paired electrons, we have no unpaired electrons, it's a diamagnetic compound. The paired electrons, instead of creating a magnetic field, they actually contain themselves and repel external you know, magnetic fields. So these are slightly repelled by magnetic fields. So we're going to look at um, the spectrochemical series, whether we're talking about a weak field or strong field. So that'd be a small splitting or a large splitting. And um, see how it works out in compounds. So if we're starting with this, um, chromium, and this is a, um, for both these compounds we're dealing with a Chromium two plus, uh, two plus, really. chromium two plus. That mark is failing. So both these compounds are chromium two plus. So we have chromium with six waters, chromium with six cyanides. So water is the first of our weak fields, and cyanides is a strong field. So we have a weak field and a strong field ligand. So what's the difference between these? So 
sometimes the questions are asking whether we have paramagnetic or diamagnetic. In this case, we're asking which one's a higher spin or if there's a higher spin than the other one. So if we have a, um, a weak field, that means we don't have much splitting here. We don't have much splitting. We're going to fill each orbital first before we start to pair them up. So we put in one, two, three, fill the lower levels, but our fourth one in the higher levels. That's a weak field. That's a high spin state. So we call the weak field to be high spin. We have a uh, cyanide as a strong field. So we're going to have a big delta field. So we're going to put all our electrons in the lower level first. So one, two, three, and then pair up the, the fourth one. We don't go up into higher state. So that's a, a strong field, or what we call low spin. This is, demonstrates the difference. So here we have four unpaired electrons versus two unpaired electrons. So the four unpaired electrons will create a higher spin, a stronger pull into a magnetic field. The two unpaired electrons, a lower spin, and not as strong pull into a magnetic field. They're both paramagnetic. Yeah, they're both paramagnetic. Uh, so, in this case, with four electrons, there's no option of actually being a diamagnetic compound. So, I'm pulling one off uh, the worksheet here, asking whether uh, this diamine dichloroplatinum 2 in a tetrahedral geometry is going to be uh, paramagnetic or diamagnetic, I think is what it was asking for. Uh, we're going to ask, um, okay. So when we look at this, we see that we have two different ligands, but one of the ligands, ammonia is a strong field, whereas the other one, chloride, is a weak field. So which one do we choose between the, uh, the weak field and the strong field uh, formulations? So we have a total of eight electrons in platinum. So platinum's in column 10, it loses two electrons, and those are the S, uh, loses S electrons first, so it's left with eight electrons, and those eight electrons are in the D orbital. So I put in the way that we would normally fill it. So for a weak field, um, I should label that, this is the opposite of the top here. So this is a weak field. And this is strong field. So in the weak field, we um, fill all the orbitals first. So we have used up five of the eight electrons. So now we finish off with the uh, next three electrons. So one, two, three. And we end up with two unpaired electrons. In the strong field, we fill up the bottom level first. So we pair them in the bottom first. So we've used up four of the eight electrons. So let's fill this one up. So five, six, seven, eight, and my colors are fading on me. Any better? Uh, but we end up with the same pattern here, uh, only two unpaired electrons. So this was actually in the tetrahedral, so we have two lower, three higher. So uh, sometimes there's no difference in field strength between a strong field ligand and a weak field ligand. Uh, so we still have the same number of unpaired electrons on both of these. So this also is, both of these, both structures of these, are also paramagnetic. So that leaves uh, another question, at least in my mind. So what is needed for a octahedral complex? Won't worry about the, the tetrahedral, but for octahedral complex, what is needed for it to be a diamagnetic compound? So all the D electrons at least are paired. Uh, so if we have no D electrons, and there's no unpaired electrons on the D level, we'd have to look on the P level to decide if it's truly a, a, a diamagnetic compound. At least on the D level, it's not doing anything to make it uh, uh, paramagnetic. So if we have no D electrons, we can be diamagnetic. 
if we have six B electrons with a strong field ligand, we'll have all six electrons paired up on the lower level. That's our low spin, and this is diamagnetic. But if we have those six electrons in a high spin, that is not diamagnetic. So we'll have four unpaired electrons. So that would definitely be paramagnetic. So, yeah. Enable that. And then if we have 10 D electrons, all our electrons will be paired uh, and there will be a diamagnetic compound. So we really have either zero electrons, six electrons, or 10 electrons. So the only times we can possibly have a diamagnetic complex. Otherwise, there'll just be higher spin, more unpaired electrons, or lower spin, less unpaired electrons. 